and turn over to Mark chapter 10. You know, if it's your first time with us this morning, just to get you up to speed, we're going through the book of Mark this year, right? And we're looking at it as a framework to really deeply study out the life and the teachings and the miracles of Jesus, right? And what that tells us about his heart, of his kingdom, and of his mission. You know, I think, personally, I think it's been awesome. I think it's been awesome being able to dive deeply into some of those moments and just see Jesus' heart better, right? That being said, for those who have been around, this morning's text might feel a little similar or redundant to about a month ago, right? In Mark 9, there's a very similar passage, right? And we talked about the idea of who's the greatest, right? That was the sermon title a month ago. And it was this idea that the apostles were arguing about who among them was greater, right? And Jesus is like, no, 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 you're not getting it. That's not the point. Your competition, your rivalry, you're missing the point. I'm the greatest. I need you to become like servants and children in my kingdom, right? Is that ringing any bells to anybody who's here? All right, amen. I'm glad that you're paying attention. Well, much like myself, the disciples are slow learners, right? So we come up to a very similar moment in Mark chapter 10 this morning, where Jesus again has to reframe the way that the disciples think about themselves and about his coming kingdom. So we're going to hop in and read Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 32. And just quickly, we're we're going to take our communion at the end of our service today. So if you want to participate, there's one communion cup over there. We have more. So somebody who knows where the more is, if you could get more out if we need it. Um, But yeah, we'll be taking it at the end of service today. So feel free to grab one off the table. All right, verse 32 of Mark chapter 10. It says, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. When James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, teacher, they said, We want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and at the other at your left in your glory. You do not know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But to sit at my right and left are not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, Jesus here is heading to Jerusalem, right? In just a short time, he's going to be put to death, right? And on the way there, James and John asked two questions of him, two requests. The first is that they would do whatever they ask him to do, right? And the second is a follow-up to that, which is, we want to sit at your right and left hands in the coming kingdom. You know, and their request came both out of faith and ignorance, right? James and John's request for Jesus to do whatever they asked of him came out of faith that he actually could, right? They had watched him heal the deaf and blind and the lame and the leprous, right? And they had faith that Jesus could actually do whatever they asked of him, right? And then their second request was also made in faith because they believed that Jesus was actually the Messiah coming to establish a new kingdom here on earth. They had faith that that was true, right? And before we get into the ignorance part, these were faithful requests, and I want to lift that up, right? We need to be like James and John, who are convinced that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's all-powerful, that he can actually do what he promises to do, right? So before we kind of condemn some of their questions, we need to lift that up, right? We need to have faith like James and John, But again, they were ignorant. They were ignorant in the way that they didn't understand exactly what they were asking, right? They didn't understand the kind of kingdom that Jesus was coming to establish. You know, the kind of king and kingdom that the disciples were used to was Caesar and the Roman Empire, right? The Roman Empire was established on a vast military 
power, right? And they use all these power structures about leveraging wealth and positional authority to control people and to continually expand their empire. So when they think of the kingdom, they think we want to be at the top and we want to get out of the way for the coming king, right? Even looking back through Jewish history, think about all the powerful kingdoms of old that the Jews would have experienced. The Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, even the Greeks, right? Many of which conquered the Jews at one time or another. And all these powerful kingdoms became powerful through military campaigns and heavy-handed authority. So when Jews like James and John read the prophecy of a coming kingdom, these pictures of kingdoms is what comes to mind of how to do that, right? They think of all these powerful kingdoms, and that's how God's kingdom needs to come. And they wanted to make sure they had good positions in that coming kingdom. You know, when Jesus sees that the disciples are thinking in this way about his kingdom and their greatness, that it will come through the same conquering and power grabbing as the empires of old, but he says, it will not be so with you, right? That the ways of greatness defined by the world of grabbing for power and lording authority over others, that this would not be with the disciples in God's kingdom. So our title this morning is Not So With You. You know, Jesus doesn't just stop there, though, telling them what the kingdom of God doesn't look like. He tells them what it does look like. That instead of following the ways of the world, he says that we must take on the way of a servant. And that's our first point this morning, the way of a servant. Point number one here, we're going to reread the last chunk here, verses 42 through 45. It says, Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. You know, Jesus offered an alternative to the ways of the world by saying that in order to become great, you must become a servant. Right? In order to be first, you must be last. Right, and he shatters my favorite Ricky Bobby quote out there. If you ain't first, you're last. Right, Jesus just blows that one to pieces. He says, instead, if you want to be first, you must be last. Right, it's the exact opposite of what's being said in the world. Now, to start this point, I do want to make an important distinction here in what Jesus is talking about when he calls us to be servants. Romans chapter 12, I'll give you a second to turn over there because we're going to be in it for a while. Romans chapter 12, obviously this is written to the Christians residing in Rome. Romans 12, starting in verse 6, says, We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. And if it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. You know, Paul here talks about some of the different gifts that different members of God's body have, right? And he says in there, if your gift is to serve, then serve. I think we have quite a few gifted servants in this fellowship here, right? I think about the, the guys who serve in the back and Ultraviolet, the girl that serves in the back on the AV team, right? I think about the people who serve in Kids Kingdom. I think about the people who set up and tear down, right? We have people who are gifted in seeing the need and meeting it through service, but here's the thing. All of us are called to serve in some capacity. Amen? And some people are gifted in that. Right? Some people are gifted in seeing the need and filling it. Jesus, though, is not speaking to those who are gifted in service and telling them, serve more. He said, no, if you want to be my disciple, your identity needs to be that of a servant. Right? This isn't for those who are just gifted in it. But all his followers are called to take on the identity of a servant. We should all become servants. Right? And he's making it clear that the call to follow him is a call to be the slave of all. So what does that look like? Right? What does the identity of a servant look like? Well, I think it's laid out pretty clearly in the New Testament. Actually, if we read on in Romans chapter 12, picking up right where we stopped, Paul writes a little bit about it. He says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual, spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute, persecute you. 
Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Right? And in this passage, we see things like honor others above yourselves. Right? Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. Right? Bless those who persecute you. Right? Rejoice and mourn with those who rejoice and mourn, whether you're rejoicing and mourning yourself. Right? And as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You know, and Paul doesn't explicitly say, this is the way of a servant. This is the identity of a servant. But it's clear that he's outlining that mentality for us in this passage. Right? And he goes on in Romans 15 too. He goes on a lot more. But Romans 15 too says, each one of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up, right? Galatians 5, 13 and 14 says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, Paul says that we're to use our freedom to serve one another, right? Then in chapter 6, verse 2 of Galatians, he says, carry each other's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ, you know, I don't have this one up there, but in verse 5, just to make sure no one's getting the vibe of laziness, he says, you need to carry your own loads too, right? It's not just give it all up to other people, right? That we're, we're called to carry our own as well. Ephesians 5 verse 21 simply says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And in the Greek, the word submit more literally translates to subject yourself to one another. Very much servant language, right? Or my favorite is in Philippians 2 verse 3 and 4 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Do not look to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. You know, it's not my favorite because it's easy to hear, right? But it's my favorite because it's followed up by a description of Jesus' servanthood, which we looked at a few weeks ago and we'll look at more in the next point this morning. You know, but I could go on and on. And the point is that through and through in the New Testament, Right? We see the calling not just to acts of service, but for us to take on the nature and the identity of servants. Right? The nature of a servant is that of someone who willingly looks to the good of others. Right? Willingly submitting to others, not because they have a position or title that demands it, but out of reverence for Christ. Right? Willingly coming alongside a brother or sister to carry their burdens with them. You know, and doing it all, not out of an expectation of return, but out of your love for Jesus. Let me ask you, church, is your identity that of a servant, or is it bent more towards competing or appealing to some kind of worldly authority in your interactions with each other? Are the passages above what mark your relationships with others and your identity with Christ? Or are you like the rulers of the Gentiles that Jesus spoke about, searching for authority and lording it over others when you get it? You know, I know for me, the identity of a servant is one that I struggle to live in well. You know, even in my own home with my own wife, whom I love more than anyone on this planet, I struggle to be a servant, right? To give of myself in the way that a servant would. To choose in an argument not to be proud or conceited or win, even if I think that I'm right, right? But rather to choose humility and peace and not have to win every argument, right? Even to think about when I've had a long day and she's had a long day and all I want to do is sit down, but to willingly cook dinner and clean up, right? Because that's the worst part of it. Cooking's fine, but cleaning up after so she doesn't have to do it the next morning, right? Those mentalities of a servant. And that's with my wife, who, who I love, right? Let alone in my interactions with all of you, right? I mess that up all the time too. You know, and I think that it's having the same conversations with a brother about the same sin or about the same fear, about the same issue, and it's not changing, and I just want to, come on, but not doing that. Just appealing out of love and kindness and grace in Jesus, right? It's choosing to inspire and encourage the students in my ministry rather than getting frustrated and critical when I feel like they're not doing enough, right? Whatever that even means, but choosing not to be like that. Choosing to seek input and even critique from those younger in the faith than me rather than using my position as a barrier to humility. You know, I don't know about you, but the call to put on the servant's identity is one that I can struggle with, right? And it's not because I don't want to, 
because it's hard, right? It's because I'm being transformed and molded into the image of Jesus, and that's uncomfortable, right? You're being pushed and molded and cut and trimmed and pulled and stretched, and that's how it feels sometimes, right? It feels a little uncomfortable. You know, the way of a servant is the calling delivered from Jesus to anyone who wants to be his disciple. It's the call to empty ourselves, take the low position, be humble and not seek our own glory, but rather the glory of God and the good of others. You know, it's a calling that will take diligence and humility to live out. But the amazing thing is, is that the way of a servant was the way of Jesus. Point number two here, the way of Jesus. Jesus didn't just call his followers to live like this. He lived it himself and set the example for us. Right, verse 45 here says in Mark 10, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, Jesus himself came not to serve, or sorry, not to be served. See, that's an important distinction. Not to be served, but to serve. Right, and this is made apparent at his birth, in his life, and through his death and resurrection. You know, Philippians 2, picking up where we left off, starting in verse 5, says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And he just told us how to do that, but now he's given us the reason. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Jesus is by very nature God, right? Hebrews 1 says that he is the exact representation of God and the radiance of his glory. But in that glory, he took on the nature of a servant and was made nothing, right? He stepped down from his heavenly throne, wrapped in glory and surrounded by tens of thousands of angels singing his praise to be born of a young girl and her fiance carpenter, in a manger, right? Jesus became nothing for us. He was not born into royalty or given some nice palace to live in or some rich parents, nor did he have power or influence in his culture. He was born a common person in an oppressive culture for us, right? He took the weakness of human form. He was hungry. He was thirsty. Probably skinned his knee and smashed his finger making different carpentry things, right? He experienced all the weakness of humanity for us so that he could be with us so that he could empathize with us and ultimately so that he could save us right he was born into a servant's mentality right and he continued to live as a servant through his life one of my favorite examples of this is in john 13 we're going to read a little chunk and i just encourage you to picture this in your mind as i'm reading this i right? picture this moment john 13 starting verse 3 this is the night that he's going to be crucified right he's having the last supper with the disciples verse 3 says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize what I'm doing now, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. That's why he said, not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You know, it says that Jesus knew that God had put all things under his power, so, right, verse 4, so he took off his outer clothes and wrapped a towel around his waist and washed feet, right? He, the king of all creation, got down on his knees and took the dirty feet of first century Jews who walked in sandals all the time on dirt roads filled with poop and all kinds of nasty stuff and did the job of a servant, 
and washed their feet. Right? And we also see that Jesus, or sorry, Judas doesn't leave until after this moment. So we have reason to believe that Jesus washed his feet as well. Right? There, there's no reason to doubt that he did that. So when Jesus calls us to be a slave of all, he means all. Right? And he lived that. Not just the people who are easy to serve. Not just the people who are going to serve you back. Not just the people you want to serve. We're called to be a slave to all. And he lived as a slave to all, even his betrayer. Right? I think even back to Mark 1 that we opened up this year with. You know, Jesus stayed up late into the night after being bombarded by people all day and healed the sick and the crippled in the town. Right in Mark 6, when he's trying to get away to a quiet place with his disciples and rest, thousands of people chase him around the shoreline of the Galilee, right? And as soon as he lands, he goes straight into teaching them, right? And if that's not enough, he then feeds them from the sack lunch of a child, right, to take care of each of their needs, right? Or in the way that in John 17, we see Jesus praying right before he's arrested. He's taken to the cross. And what's the topic of his prayer? Others. Right, he starts out with, God, I pray that you would be glorified. Right, then he prays for his disciples that they would be able to bear up under the persecution with the message about Jesus. And then he prays for us. Right, he prays for those who would come to know him later on. You know, even facing death, Jesus' mind was not filled with his needs, but serving others. Right, the way of Jesus was the way of a servant. You know, and his servant identity came to a climax on the cross, which Jesus was predicting at the beginning of our main text this morning. You know, the disciples missed the point in the moment, but Peter writes later about what Jesus did on the cross. First Peter 2, starting in verse 21, says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, that you should follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate, when he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross. He died so that we might live. Jesus' death on the cross was one giant act of service in which his life became our atonement for and ransom from the sins that we've committed against him. Jesus' identity was that of a servant. You know, he willingly humbled himself to the weakness of human form, lived in a place of servitude all his life, and ultimately, through the most horrific death possible, served us on the cross, be, becoming a ransom for many. He set the example for servanthood and calls us to do the same and follow him, right? When James and John asked in the beginning of our text this morning to sit at his right and left hand, he said, you don't know what you're asking, right? Can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? You know, he's helping them see that the way of Jesus is not like the way of the world. He's like, you, you don't get it. It's not about conquering. It's not about wielding of authority. Rather, the way of Jesus is the way of suffering. It's the way of the cross, it's a way of servitude. It's the laying down our lives for the glory of God and the good of others. You know, of course, James and John respond, yeah, we can. Right? They were prepared to go to war and die in the service of God's kingdom. And, you know, the thing is that the, the coming of the kingdom wasn't what they expected, but they did. Right? They did end up doing that. We read in Acts that James was killed by Herod for preaching the gospel. Right? And we know from John's writings that he was exiled to the island of Patmos because of his service to God's kingdom. You know, and thankfully, we live in a country where that's likely not going to happen to any of us here, right? It does happen around the world, still, just so you're aware. But for us here, it's likely not going to look that way, but we're still called to take up the cup of Christ, right? It's taking the low seat at the table. It's denying ourselves and our own desires and choosing to look first to the call of God and then to the good of others, you know, our call is to take on the nature of a servant and allow God to lift us up in his time, not on our own. To say to the ways of greatness defined by the world, no matter the loss, not so with me, not so with us, right? Because Jesus said, not so with you. You know, as we end today and transition into our time of communion, I want to read one last passage of a reminder 
of why, right? Why do we live in the way of a servant? You know, 1 Peter 3, just after what we read in chapter 2, right, he, he writes this as a follow-up, Peter does, and it's so beautiful, right? Peter finally got it. After, like, years of preaching the good news and being with Jesus, he finally got it, right? And we get to read this in the passages that he writes, but verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And after being made alive, he went and made a proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, while God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as a pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. You know, I love this passage because it is such a beautiful description of our salvation in Jesus. Jesus died in our place, right? The righteous for the unrighteous. And Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 5 that he became sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us, right? So that we could be brought to God, right? And it's not just this washing of the outside, that saves us, right? It's the transformation through the resurrection of Jesus on our entire lives that saves us and allows us to be with him.